Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the fourth installment of the doctoral student edition of the forum. Um, as the PhD program has grown, this event has become an important tradition for highlighting the great work of our doctoral students. My name is Rachel Kittleston. I'm the program coordinator for the PhD. Um, and thrilled to introduce um, our students who we who will be presenting. Uh, today we're pleased to have four of our center's geospatial analytics PhD students share their research in a series of short talks. Presenting today are Jenna Abramson, Owen Smith, Margaret Lorimore, and Andrew Shannon. So after each talk, we will have a short time for questions, and then we'll move on to the next one, but we will also save some time at the very end uh, to get back to any questions, anything you've thought of uh, in between there. So up first, our co-presenters, Jenna and Owen, who will discuss modeling and understanding using temporal analysis of transient Earth data, aka mutated. Jenna and Owen are advised by Dr. Josh Gray. All right, so hi everybody. As Rachel said, my name is Jenna Abrahamson and this is my colleague Owen Smith and we are third year geospatial analytics PhD students in Dr. Josh Gray's lab. And today we're gonna to be talking about modeling and understanding using temporal analysis of transient earth data or mutated. And this work comprises the research assistantships that we came in on together and worked on for our first two to two and a half years here at the center. So um, as Jenna mentioned, we've worked on this for a couple of years now. Um, just a high level overview. Um, our work was funded under the directorate of um, IARPA, uh, the Intelligence Advanced Research Project Activity, it's federally federal agency. Um, they invest in high risk, high payoff research. And uh, yeah, they focus primarily on intelligence. Uh, you may be more familiar with their uh, counterpart or sister uh, directorate called DARPA, uh, which creates our, all of our fund uh, spy planes and everything. Um, underneath that, <laughs> sharing the wrong screen. Yeah. Sorry about that. So uh, underneath the IR by directorate, um, the program we were sp specifically working on was called the SMART program, uh, which was designed to automate broad area search uh, with multi-source satellite imagery uh, to detect, monitor, and characterize uh, progression of anthropogenic and natural uh, processes. Um, mostly, though, we were focused, is focused on characterizing and finding heavy construction globally. Stop and start over. Sorry. <clears throat> Let me click on the next one. Um, so uh, one crucial aspect of this program is, unlike a lot of other research um, grants, it was a competitive program where. Um, basically, teams like the all the groups you see up here, there were essentially seven kits of that, and we were all competing for continued funding, uh, and our algorithms were scored continuously throughout the duration of the program. Um, so we were partnered uh, under the Accenture um, consultancy uh, team, and we had various academic team members listed here, in addition to a couple of industry um, components as well. 
But at state uh, and in CGA, uh, our small team was, um, as mentioned, our PI, uh, Josh Gray. And uh, in addition to Jenna and I, uh, Laura Wendell Berger, um, who developed some of our algorithms as part of the dissertation, is now at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. So as you can see from the title of this Wired article on the SMART program, spawning objects from space using a single satellite image has become relatively easy for the remote sensing community. However, monitoring objects from space over time as images are collected is a much more challenging task, and this kind of forms the basis of what the SMART program was all about. So our ultimate goal was to identify construction sites on Earth using only data from satellites. Now, as Owen said, and what this article terms it, this whole program was basically a battle royale. So it was this competitive base funding system where we had quarterly code evaluations where algorithms were scored for accuracy as well as cost and a trip to Washington DC every three months to update the government on our research progress. And we say this just to give you a little background on the nature of this kind of fast paced project. Now, there are many aspects we could touch on for this project, but we chose to just highlight a few of you for today. And so to start off, we're going to introduce RoboBase, which is a novel time series based land cover change detection algorithm developed by team member Laura Wendelberger. And then next, we'll go into a couple of the different operational challenges scaling RoboBase to be applied at a global level. And so first off, we're going to talk about characterizing construction from other types of land cover changes that occur, such as flooding or say crop change. And then second, we'll talk about Considering computational efficiency when running an algorithm at scale in this online monitoring mode and going from research code to production level code. And so, as I mentioned, we're going to use data from satellites, but RoboBase is this time series based change detection algorithm. So, how exactly do we get from satellite images to time series? Well, if you look at this graphic here, on the left, you can see a series of satellite images collected over time for a specific region. Now, let's say we follow an individual pixel through these images. And we can calculate something like the normalized difference vegetation index, which is basically a remote sensing index that's used to look at greenness or the density of vegetation within a pixel. Now, let's say this pixel is forested. So here on the left, you can see this high NDVI value, a nice harmonic trend to it to, to add to the seasonality. And so this is what we expect from a forested pixel. Now, you see this abrupt shift when that pixel gets developed and this vegetation gets cleared away to construct something. And this shift in land cover states is exactly what we want to try and target with our change detection algorithm. And with that, I'll toss it over to Owen to introduce RoboBase. So as Jada mentioned, uh, it's a time series based um, algorithm. So uh, it was developed by Laura uh, during her time here at NC State. Uh, it's based on this uh, Adams and McKay paper here listed underneath the, the title of 2007, which introduced the Bayesian online chain point detection algorithm. Uh, one the, the two key takeaways um, seen here in these figures is our data arrives in time steps that break up chain points. And so each observation point you see on that has several things attached to it, but primarily just the data value, the spectral response of that observation, and then the temporal information. Um, and then second, in order to figure out and track the current state of our system or our observations, uh, similar to what Jenish had shown in the last slide, de deforested versus forested. Uh, we use uh, run link uh, matrices to officially track that, it makes it computation scale. Um, it's in especially important uh, because with this algorithm, we have a mentality shift. Uh, instead of looking at when observations start to deviate from a given model, uh, we instead look at how far back does our current model fit. And so with those run length matrices, in, those, in, in order to track the run length, we are able to compute the probability of a model fitting back over there to the run lengths. And so for this change map that you see here, that's the 12 kilometer by 12 kilometer region Korea, the circled area, we have pixels that look like this. And so we can see different models moving through time, starting at the current most recent observation point. And the darker kind of purple models have a higher probability of um, fitting to the current state, which is, as you can see in that top uh, signal, uh, shifts abruptly similar to deforestation. Uh, and so with that, when those models start to no longer fit the current run length, that is when we trigger a time point, a change point rather. And so having an algorithm is one thing, 
Um, but applying it and you know scaling it up for analysis is a totally different piece. So we were tasked with um, using this uh, with Landsat and Sentinel two imagery, um, monitoring for changes between 2015 and 2021. Uh, this occurred for evaluations at 17 regions across the globe uh, at a moderate uh, 30 meter resolution. And so this is just uh, kind of a, an example of what you would expect to see coming out of robo bays um, in real time as we start to apply uh, this to various regions. And so the red outlines you see here are like confirmed uh, construction sites that we were tasked with finding. And then the uh, brighter blue areas you see popping up on the map uh, correspond to active uh, construction within the time frame that's moving up top. Uh, the dark blue areas are previous construction changes, previous observations, and so um, that allows us to characterize what is currently happening versus what previously happened. Um, and it just gives us kind of like a temporal window, allows us to fill out the sites um, for various downstream tasks. And so, and then Jenna will now start to discuss some of the operational challenges. Oh, so the first challenge we are looking at is being able to characterize construction changes from other types of land cover change. So Rollerbase is built as a general land cover change detection algorithm. So it detects everything. So if you look in this upper left area, you'll see an example of a water to land conversion that happened in Bahrain. And now, while this could maybe be considered some sort of construction change, it's not the type the government was interested in. Similarly, in the upper right, you can see an example of agricultural change. Here it looks like an irrigation event took place in this crop field. And again, while this is a real change that happened on the landscape, it's not what we want to target. The center one is an example of a bridge construction in South Korea. And this is an example of the type of heavy construction events that we are really interested in focusing on. And so with this in mind, the real question became, how can we retain these heavy construction areas with rural bays while filtering out the other types of land cover changes that we're not necessarily interested in? And so ultimately, this turned into a classification problem. And so naturally, we turned to a variety of different machine learning algorithms that we would be able to apply with minimal training data and efficiently in an online monitoring mode. So partnering with data scientists at Accenture, I worked to test a variety of algorithms, including Decision Tree, Random Forest, XGBoost, and LightGBM. And these were all just tree-based machine learning modules. Additionally, a variety of input features were also tested with these models, the first of which being just the raw spectral signal. So things like your red, green, and blue bands, things like the MDVI index I mentioned earlier, all the way up to things like linear and spectral mixing analysis, which is just another way to tease as much information as possible out of these spectral bands. Next, we also calculated some texture metrics, and this can kind of be thought of exactly what it sounds like. You're trying to tease the texture out of, out of an image. So considering some more spatial information by calculating this using neighborhoods of pixels, and also this helps us to better define edges, which we would expect with objects like buildings on the ground to have these more defined edges to them. And lastly, we use the actual harmonic time series coefficients. So if you look at this little snapshot of the time series, things like the mean, the amplitude, and the overall variance before and after a detected change point were also used in these models. And so if you look here on the left, you can see an example of a change map before and after applying this machine learning module. So the top is before and the bottom is after. And again, these red polygons are change targets. The biggest thing I want you to take away from this is we had a dramatic reduction of false positives by applying this module. This was similarly reflected in our F1 scores. So if you look at this bar chart here, F1 is basically just a way to measure accuracy. And so it's our overall balance between the precision and the recall, with recall being how well are we hitting these red change targets and the, pre the precision being how many false alarms do we raise in the process of trying to hit these targets. So as you can see in this bar chart, a higher F1 score where that smiley face is, is better with one being a perfect match. And on the X axis here, these are just a variety of the regions that we tested this in. So from Bahrain to Peru to New Zealand, getting this to work in a variety of different geographic areas. And so as you can see here, these yellow bars are what we call this expert filter, or this really naive just set of if-then rules that we used to, at first to try and filter false positives. Now this blue bar is once we started applying the machine learning module. And you can see across every single region, this provided substantial increases in our F1 score. Now, interestingly, when comparing the algorithms themselves, Random Forest and Light GBM tended to be the best performers. With XGBoost being all right, it didn't quite achieve the precision we were looking for, and Decision Tree was outperformed by all the rest of these three. 
But overall, what I want you to take away from this is that by applying a machine learning module, we are able to classify these construction changes and, ta and tailor that with RoboBase to improve our algorithm's overall performance. So on top of all of that, um, all of our code was deployed on AWS constantly for evaluations, testing, development, all of that. And so computational cost efficiency became a huge priority for us, especially as we're competing against um, other people in the industry and in academia doing this thing all day, every day. Um, and so the biggest takeaway for us is that research code does not necessarily equal production code, um, especially in a competition like this or just in industry. Um, and so we found that a lot of our numerically expensive methods, um, we needed pretty quickly to get them into a compiled language such as C or C++. Um, in order to get the uh, efficiency that we needed. Um, even when we write kind of optimized R code, it, it's really hard to match that the efficiency of a compiled language. Um, a big thing for us is that we had to be really, um, we had to target what we were converting um, tactically because it's a, also a time, it's like development time is really important. Uh, we can only work on so many things. We're also trying to do research. Um, but it was a big boost for us um, in, in it was rewarding for us as well. Um, and so just a quick um, example is one of our um, steps for uh, like this cloud detections, uh, pre-processing step um, was initially written in R. Uh, we'd spent some time trying to optimize it um, for a single band for a fairly large region. Uh, it took well over an hour to run, uh, and that is in parallel for that given band. So I don't know, 16 pixels running at a time um, versus uh, taking the time to convert it into C, C++, uh, run it down to 1.4 minutes, uh, and we were able to run, say, the eight bands we were running this on simultaneously. Um, just kind of high-level overview of things that we accomplished with that. Um, was 94% reduction in memory usage, 98.7% uh, reduction in processing time, and 57% reduction in cost, uh, which is, again, a really big deal when we're running everything on AWS. Um, we can spin up as many nodes as we want on there, but we burn cash if we do that. So key takeaways from the entire presentation is RoboBase, uh, novel change detection algorithm for detecting all types of land cover change can do so very effectively. If you're interested in it, let us know, uh, and there'll be a paper linked at the end here as well. Um, by integrating uh, machine learning classifiers, uh, we can better extract construction changes in near real time, as opposed to just a general, hey, something changed here. Um, And then additionally, uh, scaling from research code to production code uh, requires time and should be targeted effort, but is worth the cost. And with that. Now we'd like to thank all of our funders and all the industry and research partners we got to work with, especially at Boston University and Accenture and I2R for creating the data cubes that we ran all this on. And then of course, special thanks to CJ for supporting us in all our research and academic pursuits. So I'm going to actually move us along to the next one. So if you can hold any questions that you might have for Jenna and Owen, and then we'll loop back at the end and get those. Um, so up next, we have Margaret Larimore presenting her work on creating spatially complete zoning maps using machine learning. Margaret is co-advised by Dr. Georgina Sanchez and Dr. Ross Mintemeyer. Okay. Yes. Awesome. Great. Okay, hi, so Rachel, thank you for that introduction. As she said, my name is Margaret and I'm a third year PhD student here at the center. And today I'm excited to share results from our recent paper, creating spatially complete zoning maps using machine learning. Oops, I think my might have lost it. Awesome. All right, so the first question that might come to mind is what exactly do I mean by zoning? So zoning is a land use regulation tool that essentially divides our lands into zones of acceptable uses, essentially determining what could become a bustling downtown, a suburban residential development, 
a local shopping destination or agricultural lands. And zoning is used in over 95% of our cities and towns across the United States and has wide reaching impact, impacts beyond our urban and built environments to also shape our society and our economy. So now that we're on the same page about what exactly I mean by zoning, I wanna to touch on why we think machine learning can be an appropriate approach to try and predict zoning at scale. So first of all, zoning is notoriously confusing and difficult to access. So zoning is regulated, is able, every city and town across the United States is able to enact a zoning ordinance. And there are no state or federal regulations that dictate exactly how they are zoned or how it's codified, meaning that zoning can look drastically different even in neighboring cities and towns. And to access that data, there are no national databases as of right now. So to access the data, you do have to go and contact each of those governing bodies. And in North Carolina, there's over 600 governing bodies that have the right to enact zoning. So it's this really messy and confusing process, difficult to get to. And that's where we think machine learning can step in to take this confusing, difficult process and turn it into a workflow that's much more generalizable, efficient, and scalable. So we divided our workflow into two components. The first part was to go ahead and gather this data. So we went ahead and began to contact and visit web pages of municipalities and counties across North Carolina to gather zoning information. And so another little difficult piece to the zoning puzzle is that zoning data is also typically divided into two formats. The first is a zoning map, which will tell you what areas, what neighborhood or certain block is regulated to be zone A or zone B. But to understand what that means to that particular jurisdiction, you then have to go and find a zoning ordinance. So this is a text document, and it can be anywhere from 200 to 500 pages that details to you what exactly zone A means for that particular jurisdiction. So we went through the process of gathering these zoning maps and zoning ordinances and combined and reclassified them across the state of North Carolina in order to understand how that land was being zoned. So we underwent a tiered reclassification process for these zonings, and we decided on three core zoning districts and 13 sub zoning districts. We broke down our first core district residential into six sub districts based on the number of dwelling units allowed per acre in that particular zone. Also within our residential zoning class, we include agricultural lands as across North Carolina, all agricultural lands also allow for low density residential development. And our second core class, non-residential, we break it down into four different sub-districts of open space, commercial, industrial, or office. And in our final core zoning district is mixed use, which allows for any two or more uses. So this could be residential and commercial or commercial and industrial, any combination of uses. And then we break that down into three sub-districts, including downtown areas and also areas designated for future development or planned use. So once we went through and we combined and reclassified those data across North Carolina, we ended up with this map, which was observed zoning of, uh, for North Carolina, covering approximately 25% of the area of the state. And here I'm displaying those 13 different sub-districts that I was just mentioning. So once we had that complete reclassified map of zoning for North Carolina, we then went into our second stage of the workflow, which was building our model. So the first question we had to answer when building our model was, what did we think we needed in order to predict zoning? What did we think could explain the variation found in zoning districts? So we ended up with a suite of around 39 predictors, which I have grouped here into four just for ease of discussion. So the first group we have is natural environment, and this could include historical land use measures or distances to agricultural lands. The second group here is population, which could include population totals and density. The third group is social or society, which includes demographic indicators, as well as indicators such as distances to community centers like schools. And then the final indicator we have here is our built environment, which includes indicators such as distances to interstates or roads. So once we had our predictors and our zones, we went ahead and started with our machine learning approach. And we selected a random forest machine learning approach for this. And using that random forest model, we were able to predict across the entire state of North Carolina. So I wanna bring back this picture we have of observed zoning across North Carolina. And I wanna point out a couple of things to you before we start to look at our predictions for the eighth state. So the first thing is, notice that we have a varying amount of zoning data available per county across the state. We have some counties like I have highlighted here, Randolph County in Central North Carolina, where we've gathered almost 90, 95% of zoning data for that particular county. Alternatively, we have Wilkes County here in Western North Carolina, where we gathered some amount of data for about 10% for that county, but much less than we have for Randolph. 
And then finally, we have counties like Hyde out here on the coast of North Carolina where we didn't gather any data. And depending on the amount of data we had for zoning, we assess the accuracy for that area slightly differently. So I want to start with the case of we have some amount of zoning data for a county. And when we run our predictions, we get this completed map of zoning across each of those counties, even those counties where we had just a small amount of data. And to assess the accuracy, we use a number of different indicators. We have precision, recall, and F1. So precision is a measure that tells you out of the predicted instances of a particular zone, how often that zone was observed on the ground. Recall alternatively tells you out of those observed instances of a zone, how often it was predicted. And F1 is a convenient way of discussing both precision and recall with one measure, and it's simply the harmonic mean of those two values. So we can look at our each of these values, both overall and per class. And a perfect value for each one of these would be one, with the worst possible value being zero. So you can see that overall in these regions that we have some amount of data for, we have really strong performance with an overall F1 of 0.97. But I also wanna break this down per class. And I know this is a lot to look at on one slide, so I wanna just point out a couple to you. <laughs> And I want to look at office in particular. So office zoning district was our poorest performing class in this circumstance with an F1 of still of 0.94. So still really strong performance, even our lowest performing class. However, what I want to mention about this one is that we have a lower F1 than precision. So our F, our, I'm sorry, a lower recall than precision. So our recall is at 0.9. Again, it's still really strong. But what this means for office is that out of the observed instances of office, the model is predicting office about 90% of the time. However, when we look at our precision, we can see that out of the predicted instances of office, 98% of the time, we are correctly predicting it. So taking these two together, we can understand that maybe we're under predicting this office class as we're missing some of those observed instances on the ground. Alternatively, we have classes like residential medium high, where again, we're seeing a really strong F1, but in this instance, we have a slightly lower precision than recall. So we know in this case, perhaps we're over predicting this class by looking at those combination of performance measures. So returning to this picture of our observed zoning, I wanna to touch again on this case in which we have zero zoning information for that particular county. So in order to test this case, we decided to do strategic training and testing by removing certain counties from our training data set and applying back to the model to that area now that it was removed from our training data set. And our results vary pretty dramatically depending on what county was removed. So I wanna take one example to look at today, which is Cleveland County here in North Carolina. So here's a zoom in of that observed county zoning of for Cleveland. And these blank colors are areas that we didn't have any data for. And when we include Cleveland County in our training data set and then predict for those regions that we're missing, this is what the prediction of Cleveland County looks like. And this has those really strong performance measures that we saw before, those F1s of 0.97. So really accurately depicting what Cleveland County zoning looks like. However, when we do those strategic testing of removing Cleveland County from our training data set and apply it back, we get a picture more like this. So you can see it looks different. And when we look at our accuracy for this measure, we can see that our sub-district zoning is doing really poorly, but our core district zoning is doing pretty well. We're predicting that it is in fact a residential land, but we're missing those densities. So where it was medium density residential, we're predicting medium low. And so we're missing some of that subtlety that was better depicted with our other model. And so this is really nuanced it depends on the county and it varies how our performance does. And we have a lot more detailed information about this in our manuscript and our data release, but we don't have that much time today. So I'm gonna go back to our observed zoning and take a look at what our predictions look like for the entire state. So here are our predictions for North Carolina using that random forest machine learning approach with our waters and our protected areas removed. And so what might strike you about this is how much residential land we're predicting. That is pretty consistent with our understanding of zoning in the United States and North Carolina as a whole, with most 85 plus percent of zoning being for residential land. So this, looking at a picture of zoning across North Carolina, looks pretty consistent with our understanding of how zoning operates in the United States. So before I wrap up, I wanna leave you with a couple notes on where we're going from here. So first of all, our manuscript with these results is currently under review in computers, environment, and urban systems, but our data and code are already openly accessible, and I have links to those in just a moment. The results from this work, so this map of zoning in North Carolina, will be used on future research in order to better predict future urban development in the region. 
And finally, this data has already been shared and this workflow has been shared with the local planning department in North Carolina who are utilizing the results to hopefully address some of their future planning for that area. So yeah, thank you so much. Here are the links to my workflow and to my data set. Um, are there any questions? Yes, thank you for that question. Test. <laughs> I crossed my mind after I went past it that I forgot to mention that. For the training and testing for that first case I was showing of those original zoning. Here, let me go back to that table. There we are. Um, we did an 80-20 split. So these are a data set where we removed 80, uh, 20% of that training data set and pass it back to those 20% that remained. Um, and we did a number of different tests when we were developing this workflow where we also brought it down to training on 20% and testing on 80%. And we still saw the same, same really strong performance for that particular example. Which, um, you mentioned the 39 predictors for zoning, which ones were the most helpful and were any not as helpful that you thought? You know, yes, I have a slide for that. <laughs> um, most surprisingly, we had some voting indicators that were included in, okay, um, sorry, this is kind of a hard to look at, but these are 39 predictors and the best performing predictors there on the far right side, proportion of Republicans and proportion of Democrats. So these were data that were available at the county scale and it was a registered number of voters. And those were our two strongest performing classes. I think there are two reasons for this. First, zoning is highly politicized with zoning varying pretty dramatically when you look at more Republican leaning versus more Democratic leaning counties. Also, it's our only indicator that was by county. Um, and so I think part of what it was getting at was that variation that you can see between counties were those data that were changing. And then there are a couple of uh, considerations that you would kind of expect, like the third highest performing predictor was our building heights, which kind of makes sense, yeah. Can I think the difference when you remove like the missing data and the, I think you called it the sub? Yeah. So we had like our sub districts versus our yes. So right, the, yeah, I want to know what the like trade off is for zoning decisions and having like a stronger like sub district versus more district. Oh, in terms of performance or in terms of actual zoning regulations, yeah. like if I were to if I was somebody who wanted to say, oh, like I see these two different maps, maybe one looks different, and I wanted to make a decision based on that. Would there be any real difference in my decision? In terms of if you were looking at a predicted core zoning map and a predicted sub-district zoning map. Mm -hmm. um, so we have three. <coughs> so this is my predicted core district zoning map, if that's what you're mentioning. So it has the res residential, non-residential, and mixed-use classes. Mm -hmm. What's really beneficial about the core districts is terms of communication and the way that zones are typically codified. Like in most zoning ordinances, it will say, here are residential classes. R1, R2, R3, breaking those down by density. And so they're often discussed that way, but when you are looking at an actual zoning ordinance, it will usually have those sub-district delineations. These hierarchies also came became helpful when we were looking at our predictions and our accuracy to be like, okay, we have really strong performance in our residential sub and our residential core district. That's breaking down when we look at our sub-districts. So it helped us to tease out what was going on in the model. Does that answer your question? I think we're out of time. Okay, thank you. Margaret. Um, lastly, we have Andrew Shannon, who is advised by Dr. Robert Scheller. And Andrew will discuss his research on fire and drought, projecting the impacts of future forest disturbances in the southwestern United States. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we put the screen for the um, Yeah, thanks everybody for coming. Um, I'm always really impressed, impressed by what my classmates do, and I'm also excited to share a little bit about what I do. Uh, again, I'm Andrew Shannon. I'm a third year PhD student here in the Center for Geospatial Analytics, advised by uh, Rob Scheller, who's also a faculty fellow. And I wanna talk a little bit about why we're working on this project of understanding future fire and drought behavior in the Southwest in collaboration with the Nature Conservancy of Arizona, as well as some of the geospatial analytic tools we're using to do so. 
Uh, so the landscape that we're specifically interested in is in northern Arizona, this brighter teal uh, region that is a subset of a larger expanse of national forest land uh, that is that comprises the For Forest Restoration Initiative, which is an interagency stakeholder driven project with the aim of restoring fire adapted qualities to forests of the southwest. Um, and our landscape in particular, again, that brighter uh, teal color um, is about 400,000 hectares um, in size because we are interested in the landscape scale dynamics. Um, so it's about uh, a little bit larger than the state of Rhode Island, not quite as big as the state of Delaware. Um, and being in the Southwest, it is a dry landscape. The average precipitation is about 40 centimeters that is concentrated during the summer monsoon season. For comparison, Raleigh has about three times the amount of annual precipitation. The landscape is largely covered by ponderosa pine forest types, um, but there are some areas of other kinds of forests in this golden area here. Um, there are aspens and other mixed conifer types around the San Francisco peaks, which range up to about 3,900 meters in elevation, as well as some pinyon juniper type woodlands, as well as some grasslands and oak covered type woodlands. Um, what's particular about these largely ponderosa pine forests is the change in forest structure that's happened uh, across ponderosa pine landscapes over the past century. Historically, these landscapes are considered to be fire adapted. So the structure of the forest allowed for the maintenance of frequent low intensity surface level fires in forests that were uh, had an understory that was largely grassy and trees that were varying in age structure but clumped together um, in open park like conditions. Um, that fire regime uh, was self sustaining so that structure allowed for fires to propagate and those fires allowed for the maintenance of that forest structure, um, both from the natural fire regime, as well as with varying influence from um, indigenous fire use. Uh, from the ancestral Pueblo peoples who have occupied this landscape for millennia, as well as various tribes of the Western um, Apache peoples. Um, and that's important history because during the 19th century of American settlement, changes in land use and land management have had drastic legacy effects on these forests. So we can see from about 100 years ago, a historic photo um, depicting those characteristic park-like open conditions with the grassy understory um, of ponderosa pine forests. However, policies of fire suppression in the early to mid 20th century, as well as unregulated grazing, industrial logging, drastically changed the structure of these forests. It reduced the grassy understory, the Multiple decades without recurring fire allowed for younger saplings to grow and reach the forest canopy, um, and logging reduced the extent of older trees across these landscapes. So that the legacy effect are highly dense forests that are generally homogenized and, importantly, largely connected in terms of their fuel type, um, both horizontally along the ground as well as up vertically to the canopy. Um, and these legacy effects present concerns for the current ecosystem state of these types of forests and threats to how these forests function in terms of their ecosystem services. So I think we're largely aware of the pattern of increased fire activity throughout the Western United States in recent years. Um, these are two charts from um, the work of Singleton and others that are looking at the trends of fires from the remote sensing record. So over the past 40 years, where they noted across all vegetated landscapes in New Mexico and Arizona, an increase in both the number of fires, as well as importantly, an increase in the area of land burned in high severity fires. And it's those high severity fires that don't just remain on the understory, but propagate up to the canopy and can be carried across um, a landscape because of canopy connectivity that are 
ecologically hazardous that can cause an increase in uh, tree mortality across these sites. And given enough repeated high severity fires can even cause changes in ecosystem states from forested landscapes to grassland or scrubland. Combined with this increase in fire activity, the Southwest have also been experiencing prolonged drought conditions. This is a chart from the US Drought Monitor um, that is showing over the past 25 years um, the state of Arizona has been in a period of severe, extreme, or exceptional drought um, for uh, much of that time. Um, Drought-driven mortality itself is a concern, and there's been observed an observed increase in uh, mortality from drought across these landscapes as well. Drought is driven by heat and applies evaporative stress to the trees that can cause mortality. And given that climate will be with high confidence become hotter in the future, there's concerns that this type of drought pattern might just become the new normal and not just severe or exceptional. Uh, combined, these two mechanisms of drought-driven mortality and their recent increasing trends is a concern for managers and people living in general uh, across these regions. And that is where our research group is coming in to work with the Nature, Curvency, Nature Conservancy to better understand how fire, drought, and forest composition may change under future climate in the absence of uh, intensive restoration activity. We want to know how these patterns of mortality may change in the future under different scenarios of climate change. So if climate is particularly hot, less hot, particularly drier, less dry. Uh, and to do that, we use a spatially explicit process model that simulates forest uh, succession and disturbance. Um, the model is called Landis 2, and we parameterize a landscape to represent the initial vegetation composition of the site, its soils, its historic climate, biomass of other components of the forest and landscape across the site, um, as well as uh, other uh, characters of the landscape to simulate how vegetation changes over time um, through uh, largely regression models of um, forest growth, um, forest reproduction, seed dispersal, uh, mortality, uh, senescence, and how those vegetation changes respond to different future climate regimes and in turn, how those climate regimes respond to, or how disturbance events like fire and mortality, or fire and drought, respond to changes in climate and the forest structure itself. So that, at future time steps from the model, we can assess changes in species age classes, in biomass across the landscape, and trends in mortality. So working with the Nature Conservancy, what we're doing in this specific project is to update two different parts of the disturbance um, mo models in our uh, simulation framework. So the fire spread model and fire mortality model and the drought driven mortality model. Uh, and I'll touch on uh, the mechanics of those next. So our drought induced mortality model, um, like much of the work that goes into uh, parameterizing our landscape is based off of empirical observation, um, but we want to have species specific probabilities of mortality so that in the model, uh, we can assess the drought condition, in this case represented by a metric called the climate water deficit, which represents the atmospheric thirst at a given time step um, and can compound over time. It is the um, difference between actual and potential evapotranspiration. And we can look at the record of um, observed inventory data to determine um, trends in tr species specific tree mortality so that we can integrate those regressions into our larger model framework. <clears throat> On the fire side, uh, we simulate fire ignition spread and severity. Um, through, uh, again, different empirical measures uh, based on the historical record. So we can input uh, a surface that represents the historical probabilities of ignition combined with um, simulations of fire weather index, which is a meteorological indicator of the risk of fire ignition 
um, compute at each time step for each specific site or pixel in the model a probability of fire ignition. If ignition happens, and we can determine from where that red ignition happened on the landscape, the probability of spread to the adjacent neighbors, um, given a couple of different um, input predictors like fire weather index, the simulated fine fuels. So how connected is one pixel to the next in terms of the um, understory fuels and effective wind speed, um, which determines the direction of spread uh, as influenced um, by topography. So if a fire ignites, if a fire spreads, we can also determine how severe the fire may be um, through a metric called the difference normalized burn ratio, which is a common remote sensing based metric of um, assessing fire severity. Um, and we uh, have a regression model um, that looks at different uh, soil components, climate components, and fuel components at a site at a given time step to determine fire severity. And then again, based off of the um, observed record, we can compute the probability on a species specific basis of tree mortality given fire severity based on the tree age and its bark thickness and apply that to the model. So in our model, we have these two mechanism or these two representations of mortality drivers. We can then simulate the model under different climate scenarios and understand what the future trends are across the specific landscape, which is great. And what we're currently working on. Um, <laughs> right now, uh, I am in a stage of calibrating our model um, to better represent the historic fire regime over the past 30 years before running the model under future climate. Um, but if you are interested in those results, or at least the preliminary results, I am going to be at the College of Natural Resources Graduate Student Symposium in two weeks on March 7th, where we can talk more. Um, but regardless, I think what I want to describe with this project, since this is a more general audience, I have a mix of uh, spatial scientists, ecologists, and people from other disciplines is the reason why we're doing this project and the reason the collaboration is so important is because we can work as modelers to communicate this uh, these potential futures to the Nature Conservancy, who can then disseminate those results to the wider community that is a part of the Four Forest Restoration Initiative and use that information to inform future management plans with the goal of restoring these fire adapted communities. Um, I'm really grateful be part of this highly collaborative team and just want to list the names of everyone or some of the people who have their hands in on the model development here. I mean, of course, the Center for Geospatial Analytics for providing the means by which to do so. Um, thanks. I'll take any questions and I guess everyone can come up for questions too, or maybe me first. I don't know. Yeah, we can start. We can start. Okay, with. well, you just me. So thanks, everyone. <laughs> Oh, oh, wait, okay. there we go. And well, I've understood this, uh, the probability, the likelihood of any, of a fire from happening pretty much anywhere. And how well understood. How, yeah, how well understood. In the same way we have flood maps, right? Mm -hmm. Is there an equivalent for fire? Uh, that's a great question. So I guess for the speaker or the microphones, the question is, how well do we know the probability of fire occurring. Um, and I guess the perspective we're using in this work is we're looking at for our landscape in particular, how often has fire occurred, at least in the past 30 years, because that's the period of uh, record for our most uh, descriptive data set um, in terms of fire ignition. Uh, so it's, it's based off of empirical observation and um, regressing that against meteorological drivers of fire, so the fire weather index. Um, so it is, the likelihood is, um, based off of the observations, um, combined with that regression. Um, how, and then we try and calibrate our model to simulate that with decent accuracy. Um, 
but so um, we need localized data to answer mm -hmm. that question. There's no like off the shelf resource to have an idea of like probability and uncertainty of fire from happening pretty much anywhere, let's say across the nation, like large scale. Yeah, uh, from my is understanding, a gap or is sorry, like, is there a gap? Like, do we is that just like too complex because we really need localized, high level, high res data to answer that question or to create a let's say map that would allow us to understand? Yeah, the well, there are a lot of agencies that produce maps of wildfire risk based off of those meteorological drivers and fuel availability. So it is dependent on the site specific characteristics and the um, current weather um, that are used to prioritize where wildfire risk is highest and where resources can then be put to manage potential ignitions. Um, but there's not like a, at least to my understanding, maybe I, I'll read a little bit more on this. There's not like a physical, there's not like a physics, um, at least in this work, um, equation that generates that probability. Um, uh, based off, of, I guess, site history. Um, I'm going to ask everybody to come up uh, so that we can show them some appreciation and also uh, get any additional questions. I did want to say um, you guys are so impressive. And uh, if you are interested in uh, seeing and learning more about our students' research in the center, you're actually going to have several opportunities in the next few weeks. Um, Andrew mentioned the CNR Graduate Research Symposium on March 7th. Um, Dr. Scheller, is it too late for students to sign up if they were inspired by this and want to uh, present a poster? Let's see. COB is like midnight tonight. So, yeah. Right. So, there you go. Um, and we actually have two um, dissertation defenses in March. Uh, so, we have Laura Tompkins and Kate Jones, um, and we have more coming in April and May, so there are going to be lots and lots of opportunities coming up. Um, any additional questions or just applause, general good vibes for these folks? Any questions? Do we have anything online? Um, no. No questions online. Oh. It's a question for all of you. Uh, what do you all plan on doing with these skills uh, once you graduate? <laughs> Great question. Get a job. Was that your answer? Get a job. What, what, what kind of job? Like, what would you uh, I mean, yeah, I would like to be doing um, research software engineering uh, at a national lab, would probably be ideal. Yeah, I'm thinking something along the lines of like remote sensing, data scientist, something like national lab, federal government, maybe industry. Yeah, I think something similarly on the data support analytics side of projects that are geared towards um, something in the realm of land management or climate adaptive management. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm also planning on staying in the data analytics modeling realm, either in academia or in a national lab. Asia. Thanks. Um, great job, everyone. Really great to hear about your research. I was, um, I noticed that, of course, you all, all do very different types of research and your presentations were very different. So just wondering if you all can speak a little bit to the different design considerations you chose since there were, we just saw three different examples of visualizations and, and presentation and design. I guess I can start for us. Um, a lot of ours was, since we had to give so many presentations to the government every three months, was taking, consolidating a whole bunch of other slides, picking out what was the most important and trying to solidify them and put them into one kind of concrete story. Um, and so it was basically just simplifying a lot of ideas, mm -hmm. picking the you know main ideas we wanted to capture, and then kind of just going from there. And holding Megan's script hostage for like an hour. We would have talked for an hour. To two hours. Everything that we had Yeah, um, that's a great question, Deja. Um, yeah, I think in my case, I will obviously wasn't as focused on sharing results, but um, I, yeah, I think I wanted to pick visualization that help uh, help tell the kind of land history of the specific site, since that informs the research questions. 
Um, and conveniently, there are a lot of historical databases of um, forest uh, photos. So I could pull from those as well as, you know, making maps of the present day forest conditions. Um, so yeah, just trying to combine actual photography to put, you know, a real world image. So the landscape that we're simulating through pixels and regressions and whatnot. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, a lot of what they've said already, I have been trying to play more with actual photography, which is kind of why I started those first few slides with like, what does it actually look like? What do urban environments look like on the ground? You know? Um, and then I was working from figures from a manuscript and I was like, Hey, what do I have? How can I turn it into something that's not just figure a, you know, <laughs> from the manuscript and trying to just make it look a little bit less clunky. So there's a lot of like removing backgrounds and like pulling specific, just the map of North Carolina instead of all the background and stuff like that. Um, so I'm just kind of simplifying and trying to keep a theme throughout. Yeah. Thank you. Um, this question is for Andrew specifically. And you may have said this in your presentation, but when you're looking at the historic fire regime, is that just wildfires or does it include prescribed burning or like human caused fires? Yeah, so I didn't explicitly mention, but um, in the model, there are three categories of fire ignition, um, accidental, so human-caused fire, which um, is its own, uh, yeah, which is documented in the observed record, lightning-induced or natural fires, um, and then also prescribed fires. In this specific context, we're not simulating prescribed fires, mostly because the potential management the most immediate potential management tactics um, are more focused on um, harvest and mechanical thinning to reduce fuel load ahead of any potential burning for risk, I guess, of fire escape. Um, but yeah, the observed record and does classify fires based off of um, ignition source, human or lightning, or intentional. Um, and we reflect that in the model as well. Just a follow up. What do you mean? What do you mean by observed record? Is that supposed to be like number of trees that died, or like how do you measure like the fire, like that the fire occurred? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, there are, are a number of different data repositories that track um, fire itself. So fire ignitions, fire size, fire timing, fire source. Um, and then there are other data repositories that inventory tree data. Um, so you can observe plot level data. And then you can infer from both um, the cause of mortality at a given plot and the timing of fire to examine what fires caused which trees to experience mortality. Same with drought. Same with the drought driven mortality. You can look at the drought record and match that with the observed record of tree mortality. Okay, thank you again, everybody. I think your students, this will be you next year. <laughs> and thank you, John, as always, for coordinating. Thank you again, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.